Museum, presenting rare original footage from the first quarter century of motion pictures, selected from the archives of the Killiam Collection. The 1917 Thomas Ince production, The Clodhopper, with Charles Ray, will be presented in three parts, of which this program is the first. Clodhopper, in farm parlance, was a genially derogatory label for someone clumsy and usually not very bright. had played in Griffith's Intolerance the year before and was also in several films opposite John Gilbert. Our setting is Beeler's Bend, New Hampshire. There's to be a carnival there on the 4th of July and Everett is confident he won't have to work that day. Clodhopper Everett nor his mother can get much money out of father. With his overgrown boyish innocence, Charles Ray was a combination Henry Fonda, Gary Cooper, and Jimmy Stewart of his day. Known throughout the world as the barefoot boy with cheeks of tan, he established a new type of movie hero and was later to have many imitators. The townsfolk figure if Nelson will hang on to their money as tightly as his own, it'll be pretty safe. Here's the ugly pronouncement. There was no talking back to such a father. In Everett's boyish impatience, we see the stuff of which Horatio Alger movie heroes are made, but before success, more hardship. Everett's only dress-up suit. He's been looking over a new one in the mail-order catalog. Father has been looking over the farmer's almanac. Your eye may have caught the date in the almanac, 1919. The titles of the film were updated for the picture's 1919 reissue.
than old-fashioned American thrift, he's downright parsimonious, rather like a character out of Dickens. Patience in the face of unjust discipline. This was one of the ingredients of the Charles Ray charm, and of the many hits he made as a country bumpkin who goes on to bigger and better things. Pictures like Greased Lightning, The Sheriff's Son, Hayfoot Strawfoot, and 45 Minutes from Broadway. In this story, his patience and benevolence all come from his mother. She has secretly been saving money from selling rugs, which she's woven at night after Pa is asleep. And though she had planned to use the money for the silk dress, she really used it to get a surprise for Everett. He is overwhelmed, but he shows it by one of the bashful squirms, so typical of Charles Ray straightforward, honest, and socially untutored. Paws off for town in the buckboard. Apparently he's even keeping the bank open on the 4th of July. Everett tries on the new suit, but says, gosh, Ma, I can't go to the carnival anyway. For the first time, they decide to try to put one over on Father. Not a hat, too, Ma. Everett, the fashion plate, calls for Mary. She, too, has a brand new outfit. And so off they go to the Beeler's Bend Carnival, while Mother, in true maternal sacrifice, tries to get the sewing done all by herself. has other admirers. Charlie Ray was the original small town boy of the movies. Born in Illinois, he did a little stage work and at 18 became an extra in Hollywood. It took him about five years to make an impression. Then he hit hard and by 1920 he was making $10,000 a week. However, success was to last only a few years. The sad story of the collapse of the Charles Ray career we'll get to on our other next two programs of The Clodhopper. Right now, Charlie, as Everett Nelson, has found Mary again. At any carnival worth its name, you went in the potato sack race or tried bagging the greased pig. Uh-oh, Pa is back early and he sees Ma in the field alone. Adding two and two, he drives off toward the carnival where Everett is watching the bucking mule.
with the persistence of a young Henry Ford or a Thomas Edison, he'll try it just once more. His persistence pays off, but Pa just managed to catch the whole goings-on, and of course Everett will be punished. But is his success with a stubborn mule a sample of much greater success to come? As they say in the serials, we'll see in our next two programs, parts two and three of the 1917 Thomas Ince classic, The Clodhopper with Charles Ray. Presenting rare original footage from the first quarter century of motion pictures. Selected from the archives of the Killiam Collection. In this movie museum program, we continue with the 1917 triangle Thomas Ince classic, The Clodhopper. It's the 4th of July at the Nelson Farm in Beeler's Bend, New Hampshire. Young Everett, played by Charles Ray, was caught by his heartless father at the town carnival when he was supposed to have been working in the fields. The stylish new suit had been a secret gift from his sympathetic mother. Everett won't tell on her, but she is ready to face the music herself. time, Pa's obsession with thrift and hard work has been challenged, and he explodes. Everett can't believe he struck his own father, even to protect his mother. Charles Ray's roles always showed him as shy and unaggressive. For years after Ray's decline, movie people would speak of shy heroes as Charles Ray types. Unlike latter-day stars who wisely established types and stuck to them, Jimmy Stewart, for example, Charles Ray curiously misjudged his own talent. By 1921, he had become a top box office star and a millionaire. Then, after his 1922 picture, The Girl I Love, with lovely Patsy Ruth Miller, he insisted on trying more sophisticated roles. In several years, he was bankrupt. realized the public just didn't want him to change. He even turned down a $5,000 a week MGM contract because it called for shy, boyish roles. says goodbye to his sweetheart Mary, played by Marjorie Wilson.
discovers the torn up picture as Everett leaves Beeler's Bend for the big city. Alone in Manhattan, looking among the imposing 1917 skyscrapers for a job. Janitor wanted. Well, he was pretty good at cleaning up the farm at Beeler's Bend. Hollywood concept of a Broadway musical rehearsal. As basically unreal then, as such scenes were still to be a half century later. And already in the best Hollywood tradition, the show is about to open and there's no star. Everett has never been inside a theater and of course never been exposed to chorus girls, especially girls as exposed as these. Of course, it's a foregone conclusion that Charlie, as Everett, will wind up as the big star of the show. But what fun Ray and the Triangle studio people have prolonging the process. Triangle, incidentally, was the company formed in 1916, a year before this picture, by three pioneer producers, Sennett, Ince, and Griffith. Seligman plays a hunch. thinks he's auditioning for the janitor's job. The leading lady thinks it's terrible, but Seligman sees something. Who, me? Yes, I think you may have something. Corny, but that's what may put it over. And so Everett Nelson makes his first $10 in New York. A postcard for Mrs. Nelson. I have reached New York and it is a mighty big town. in the newspaper, but Ma knows well there was more mail than that. This Palais Royal Theater Cafe is a replica of the actual Palais Royal at Broadway and 48th Street. Paul Whiteman was featured there about this time. Later, it was Lou Walter's Latin Quarter. Other popular spots at the time were Murray's Roman Gardens with its revolving bar and the Winter Garden, a regular theater of course, but having a runway. He's thinking he'd almost rather be back home getting the strap from Pa. But the audience doesn't know how real this bashfulness is and finds it charming. So starts a fad, 
In the teens, hundreds of new dances were invented and discarded. The period was hectic, of course, and the dances reflected the public mood. The toddle, the foxtrot, the castle walk, and in this half-satirical story, it's the Clodhopper Glide, as carefree as any of them. another song written a few years earlier about another dance, the turkey trot, everybody's doing it. is as shy as ever. feels he should give back the salary. Here is the real humility that later was to be expected of performers in the mid-50s, but never again thereafter. The news reaches even Beeler's Bend. Everett Nelson, the boy with $10,000 feet. turn to gratitude, as we'll see in the final part of The Clodhopper, starring Charles Ray in our next program. Presenting rare original footage from the first quarter century of motion pictures, selected from the archives of the Killiam Collection. With this program, we conclude the 1917 Thomas Ince feature, The Clodhopper, with Charles Ray. Everett Nelson, Mr. Ray, has made a tremendous hit on the stage in New York. Even the kids in the street are dancing his step, the Clodhopper Glide. Actually, it's all a little like the story of Charles Ray in real life. Bashful farm boy overcomes humble beginnings to rock Broadway via Hollywood. in his hometown, Beeler's Bend, New Hampshire, it's a far different story. Everett's father, stubborn old Ike Nelson, president of the local bank, is in trouble. Mr. Nelson, who had abused his son and scorns his new prosperity, had invested bank funds in a canning factory.
Roger tells Ike it looks like a run on the bank. Bank runs occurred more easily and more often before the Federal Deposit Insurance System was set up at the time of the 1933 bank holiday, especially in the rural areas where personal gossip had quicker effect. One of the worst bank crises of this century was the money panic of 1907 when even some of the big New York banks failed, with lines of depositors crowding the Wall Street section until the bankers met at Morgan's and set up their own pool to guarantee deposits. Word travels like wildfire from farm to farm. Thomas Ince, who produced this picture, shared with D.W. Griffith the ability to do something that the stage could never do, create fast-mounting excitement via intercutting and a mobile camera. Like many of the biggest silent stars, Pickford, Fairbanks, Swanson, Charles Ray tried producing his own pictures. Unlike them, he had little business sense. To his credit, he wanted to make pictures of real artistic merit, but rather stubbornly tried to do too much too soon. His venture was a disaster. His cash reserves of over a million, his huge house, his fleet of autos, and his staff of servants were all rapid casualties. Ironically, for film history, the one film principally responsible for Ray's downfall, The Courtship of Miles Standish, no longer exists. So critics can't even console themselves with the thought that perhaps his sacrifice was worthwhile. Mary says, all right, she'll go to New York. at Grand Central Terminal, Vanderbilt Avenue entrance. By the 1970s, there would be no train service from New Hampshire to New York. In his rooms, Everett is thinking about spending part of his new thousands on a home. He thinks of Mary and of the high price of the home, $1,088. However, he must now go out to work in the Palais Royal Review, in which he's such a hit. Mary pulls up and into their first meeting since the night he left Beeler's Bend. Mary is played by Marjorie Wilson, who also played opposite William S. Hart the same year. Everett wonders how she happened to come. Is her mother with her? No, she came alone. father decides to try to get help from another bank. Often in a bank run situation, one bank would bail out or absorb another. In some states, the bank directors were held personally responsible on a double indemnity basis. But Ike Nelson's reputation as a tightwad has made him unpopular even in the adjoining counties. Again, Everett's sterling sense of justice is strained. All he can think of is the night he left home when Pa beat him for protecting his mother and for going to the town carnival on the 4th of July instead of working. He knows he should save his money who knows how long he'll be making this much.
give up buying the house, go back to Beeler's Bend, bail out his cross old father? Will he make such a sacrifice? 1917 audiences knew he would. He had done it many times before and would keep on doing it in films with charmingly innocent titles like Nine O'Clock Town and Alarm Clock Andy. But this time, maybe it won't be in time. The depositors are angry and it's almost time for the bank to open. So often, what happened in real life since these movie museum pictures were made spotlights ironic parallels. For instance, after the mid-twenties, Charles Ray was as broke as his father is in this picture. He played some non-bashful roles, but they didn't pay off. Nobody believed him when he played the millionaire hero looking ill at ease in a dress suit. Ray did extra and bit roles in talkies and ran a florist shop. He wrote scripts that didn't sell and was divorced by his wife, Clara. He went bankrupt again and finally died at 52 from a throat infection. Of course, it was evident from the first scenes of the film that Pa Nelson, who had paid his son one dollar a week for seven days' work on the farm, would eventually need son's help. And the young in the audiences relished this extreme, virtually caricatured picture of parental irrationality. Of course, with all his newly earned thousands, Everett Nelson can't actually cover all the bank's accounts, but he's thought of a clever scheme. With it all in one dollar bills, it will take hours to count each depositor's share. The important thing, he knows, is that those waiting see the others get paid. He has a sense of public relations his father never dreamed of. He also has cash. And so, with just $5,000 in ones, he has turned the tide. The depositors even want to put their money back in the bank. Pa sees it, but he doesn't want to believe it. It's long been a classic movie or literary situation. The conservative older generation, grown up the hard way, finally having to acknowledge the ability of youth. And here, a lifetime of old-fashioned theory is shattered by an hour of dynamic action. It's a far cry from the first scenes of the film when Everett, with Ma and Mary rooting for him, would go in and ask Pa for something and end up being chastised. The Reconciliation. To manage it, Everett has to lean further over backward than he did in the toughest steps of the Clodhopper Glide. But that was the Charles Ray screen character, naive, bashful, generous, and patient, the all-American boy from the country who makes good. Of course, today, directors would do the final kisses with more subtlety and considerably more passion. But in these pictures, it was all very satisfying, and still is. Everett and Mary leave to start their $1088 home, ending 1917's The Clodhopper, starring Charles Ray, produced by Triangle and Thomas Entz.